Welcome to another Melbourne Cocoa Heads presentation, recorded March the 15th, 2012. In this session, Chase Hocking of Shine Technologies presents his experiences using CouchDB on iOS. Let's give you a quick brief on Couch, and I'm, not, I'm no CouchDB expert, but um, most of the work I've done is CouchDB on iOS, but I will just give you a quick introduction to Couch itself, um, iOS aside. Um, I'm going to tell you about the good experiences I had, so that shouldn't take long. And then, <laughs> and then I'll, um, I'll talk about some of the bad things. And I've just got some demonstrations, so bear with me. It might get a bit, it gets a bit technical, but um, hopefully you'll be able to follow along with my demonstrations. If you can't, I apologise in advance. A bit more, a few more problems that I had, and I'm not going to show demonstrations on all the problems. It would just take too long, so just. Um, yeah, a few more bad things, and then what I've learned and sort of what I would maybe perhaps do differently in the future. So the problem that we had to solve uh, for the client I was working for, they had a bunch, of, a bunch of content. They had images, PDFs, HTML resources, and they had to get these out to um, a lot of their staff, and all their staff have iPads, and they needed some way of them to be able to present this content on their iPads to their customers. and. You'll see there I've got no, no network connection. So one of the rules they had, their, their staff were sometimes uh, not in, in range of any network. So once they're out on the road, this app had to have all this content ready to go without any network connection. So um, yeah, that was sort of one of, the, one of the major concerns. So that is what led us to the solution. Well, I like to just sort of get my hands clean here. I didn't devise this solution, so <laughs> um, I was called in to sort of implement it. But the people before me had come up with this, and um, basically all their content will be, will be stored on a server couch, which will sit there, and every one of these iPads then will run its own version of couch, which will pull down on a one-time sync. So this is, they understood they needed network to get all the content to begin with. But once the uh, staff had been in the building, used Wi-Fi, got all the content, that would be copied down onto their iPads, onto their local uh, versions of Couch, and then um, hosted straight out of there while they're out on the road. So all this Couch talk, you may not, you may, I may have lost you already. So basically Couch, it's just a document database, so it's uh, no SQL. It just stores um, documents, so it's um, yeah. There's no tables or anything like that. And the way you get these documents is through views, which is my circle window here. So <laughs> uh, it's just you code these views in the database, and they return a subset of the data. And as I said to you, I'm no couch expert, so this is just the basic understanding that I had with it to begin with, and that's about all. I really knew. And the third thing there is replication, which is what we were using to get all the content from the server down onto the database. And Couch promises this you know, seamless replication process where you can get all the content you know, pretty easily from one database to another. So that's what it promised. And um, so what's Couch Base Mobile then? So this is Couch running on the iPad itself. And I've got sync point in, graphic, in brackets there because it's gone through a lot of change and a lot of flux. And I think now, when I started, it was just called Couchbase Mobile. Now, I think if you Google it, you've got to search Couchbase sync point or something like that. So yeah, Couchbase Mobile for my presentation, though. Um, so it's coded in Erlang. So um, don't know how they got that to work on the iPad, but it does. So what happens is this compiled Erlang runs on your iPad. And when you start it up, you get a, a network address, just the local host address, that then you can hit this database at. So you start it up, it tells you the address that you can hit with a port, and then you make restful calls to that database. So that, I mean, that's all you would need to get Couch up and running. And you could do all you wanted to do with Couch using that. You know, you could, you could create your own restful requests and keep on hitting that Couch and do all, use all the API that's provided. But it's a bit silly to make all those calls when they're all sort of the same. So they've also made a, a Couch Coco framework, which what it does is that, that's in Objective C, and that was that was really good because you know you can get in there and if you know Objective C, you can change things, you can do it really easily. Unlike the Erlang here, which I don't know if anyone else can code Erlang, but I certainly can't, and it, that made it really hard to get into Couch-based mobile. But Couch Coco was easy to get into because it's Objective C. 
you could play around with things. And really what its purpose is, is just a hide couch. So this little picture says camo couch, it's made of hidden and sleep. So that's sort of, that's sort of what couch, uh, that's sort of what Couch Coco does. It just hides the couch base server that's running. So you don't need to make all these URL requests to it. You can just use Objective C code to you know call things like you know replicate or you know create create document simple things without actually having to make the URL request yourself. Um, so to hopefully make this a little bit more understandable, Couchbase Mobile that's the top one that I was talking about with Erlang. The bottom one is Couch Coco. Now you see there's no lines connecting those two directly, so. Once you've called Couchbase Mobile and told it to start, you don't do any more interaction with that at all. You now use Couch Coco, which is in Objective C, makes URL requests, hits the iPad network over the 127.0.0.1 address, and then that gets redirected to Couchbase Mobile because that's being communicated to with RESTful API calls. So I hope that makes sense. And so I can just show you quickly hopefully to clear it up if it didn't make sense. I've just got a, a few demonstrations that I've made to hopefully, uh, as I said, clear this up a little bit. So if I run this, my app should hopefully build. So yeah, so this is just the simulator here. And you'll see there that I've just spat that out to the screen there. That's the address that Couchbase Mobile has given me. So all this Objective-C stuff, if you didn't want to use it, you could easily come in here, whack this address in, 49163, and you can see that I can hit Couchbase Mobile just through URL requests. So I've done it here in the browser, but obviously you could do that in code. You could just make an NS URL requests and call things like, you know, create document and, and anything like that. So I could, for example, here, um, create a database called test db, use a put on that and send that. Okay, it's worked. So now if I change that to a get request, I've got a database that's been put into that database just using RESTful uh, resources. But also you can use this Objective-C Couch Coco stuff, which is really where you, where you want to be doing this. So this is just a button and it calls the create database method on, in the Couch Coco framework. And that's, I've told it to create demo. So if I just do demo now in the browser, you can see, there you go. I've got a, I hope you can see that down the bottom. So I just move this up a bit. No, it's as far as it goes on this res. Sorry about the res of this screen. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you can see that's created a database there called demo. And then I can create a document on that database and come in here and hit it. Generic doc. Bang. There we go. So now I've got a document down the bottom that's been returned. So basically that's all I'm, show all I'm showing you there is that, yeah, you can hit this thing restfully and interact with it perfectly, but the Couch Coco stuff does that for you. So where are we? So I've made this app and I've got all this set up. It's all working. And it was actually not too bad. I mean, I was able to preload a database onto the iPad and I created the whole UI of this app out of the documents that have been preloaded into the Couch database. And that gave the business what they wanted was the opportunity to manipulate this UI, them UI themselves. And that way all they could do is go in on a, on a web platform, edit these documents in the couch. When their staff go and sync their, data, um, their iPads, they get this new UI come down that's you know, come in through couch. And that was actually pretty good. But um, so the good things I'm talking about here, I could make synchronous calls to couch. So it was, it was actually really good to be able to get images out that I'm populating my UI with network calls that I didn't have to worry about having callbacks or anything. It was so fast that I could just create this UI on the fly with, <laughs> and we're back. Um, yeah, so I was able to create a UI and get all these resources out really quickly, just fast as reading off the file system basically. And um, the second thing, all JSON responses. So if you've worked with any I, iPhone apps before, you know that's pretty good to have JSON objects coming down. You can transform them into your Objective-C objects pretty quickly and pretty easily. 
And the third thing there is you can attach files to Couch. So even though they're JSON documents, you can attach um, individual documents of any kind to these Couch documents and just call them out like they're an extension of the URL. So you hit the document slash some movie file and there you go, you've got your movie ready to go straight out of Couch. So that was actually really good. So I've gotten through the good stuff. And <laughs> We'll move on to the bad, and I don't want to say the couch is terrible, because it wasn't, because yeah, I want to point out some of those good things were actually pretty good to, to work with. So the bad things that, we, that I experienced were things the business needed. So the business wanted SSL support for their, uh, for their couch replication. They wanted a progress meter, so while they're replicating, because they're replicating quite a lot of content, so they needed a, yeah, you know, a good progress meter so everyone all the users knew that stuff was going on. It wasn't just hanging while they're downloading these, you know, 15 gig databases with all this content in them. Um, filtering the database, you, you, when you replicate a database, you, you provided a way to filter that database. So the server database had a lot of events and things like that in it that weren't, weren't necessarily needed by the iPad. So you can have this filter, and that was working, but we couldn't quite get the parameters that you're passing to this filter to be, um, to be, um, parsed correctly, and I'll show you more in the demonstration in a minute. And we had this scenario with the filter that sometimes replication never hit a complete state, and it was just going forever, and we got stuck at the end, and it was never reporting that, hey, we've finished replication. So just go through each of these now for you, and as I said, it might get a bit technical now, so I'm sorry if I lose you on this, but I'll do my best. The, um, the ship version of Couchbase Mobile, the official re release, doesn't have SSL support. So that was required by, our, by my client. They needed that. So what, what were we going to do? Unfortunately, we had to go, uh, a developer on the web has been developing and has put improvements in, in the work he's been doing that do provide SSL. And we had to use a nightly build that was coming out of his, um, the dev work he'd done. Now, it's not great telling the business that, that we're, hey, we're going to have to use his nightly build because the version, the official version doesn't support it. But managed to convince them that, that that's what we had to do, so we had to go ahead with that. So what did we get when we got this SSL thing, um, this SSL version? Well, it's been implemented, and we got these, this config file that had three more um, settings on the right there. So one was to say, do we want to verify SSL certificates? The second one is provide us a link, uh, a file reference to the certificates that we trust. And the third one was a setting about some maximum depth, which I'm not going to talk about, but that seemed all very good. Tried to implement it. The trusted certificates file didn't work. Couldn't get it to work. So we're passing in this path to the file that's got the server certs and out we're saying they're trusted. Kept on coming back with an untrusted, um, untrusted signing authority, which just didn't make sense because, you know, we were signing the certificates. They matched the ones on the server. Battling with this for ages. Couldn't get it to work. What we did get to work well was turning the verify certificates to false, and then that way we got the benefits of the SSL encryption with this nightly build, but yeah, we still had this problem of the server certs not letting our iPads through, even though we were providing the right ones. So once again, had to add another workaround. So what we ended up doing was just using a user agent hack. So we, on the server, we just said, hey, this is, a, this is the user agent string we're gonna pass in, and you're gonna have to trust this user agent. And that in itself wasn't easy either to get that to work, because by default this top one here is what happened is what's passed to the replicate um, URL. So when you hit the underscore replicate, which is the command the URL you hit to do this, the Couch Coco passes in a source and a target, and we needed to manipulate this to pass in this headers stuff down the bottom, which Couch on their website says you can pass in this as well. So instead of passing in a source. Uh, URL as a string. We're going to pass the source URL as an object now, and then we're going to add this headers object to it, which we can pass um, authorization, so a six, base64 encoded string of a username and password, and this user agent that we want to pass through to say, hey, this is someone that you trust, which, yeah, it's not great, but once again, this is what we had to do to get around the problem. So I'll just show you quickly. What I'm going to do here is launch Couchbase single server, which is, for our purposes, this is our server. So if, say, for example, the business has this server running. I'm going to run it locally here on my iPad, on my Mac, sorry. And I'm going to hit this command that says, hey, let's replicate from the um, server database. And 
you see here this server database. So it has a server database, so it's going to work. And when we look at the log from Couch, without getting too technical hopefully again, you'll see this user agent string here is just coming through as CouchDB 2.0 beta, which by the way, it's still in beta. So unfortunately, we're using this again on a production, production um, product. So once we make these changes in Xcode, we're going <clears> to, <throat> we're going to, go to this authenticated call. And as I said, because this is in Objective-C now, I was quite happy to get in and manipulate this. So this was lucky to be able to do this in the Objective-C stuff, not in the Erlang stuff. So in this body that gets created, I'm going to pass in these um, user agent, as you can see there, and authorization. I'm going to put them in a dictionary with the object, if that makes sense. And when I run it, hopefully you'll see authentic replicate. So now what I'm passing through, once again, hopefully you'll see, down the bottom here, passing through some headers, as I was saying. And if I look at that now on the server, this is my server log, which once again would be running on your, um, your business would be running, hosting this. Now we've got demo app coming through in the user agent. So that's the way we were able to authorize our iPad users out on the road. So. Once again, hack on, it, on top of a hack to, to get this working in Couch. But these are the things that the bad that we had to sort of get through just to get some sort of security out there so no one could just get in and start copying all the business's private data. So the second thing the business wanted was this replication progress. And Couch says that they provide this in this status string. So as you're replicating a database, you can call this active task URL and it gives you a completed and a total value of how far you've got through. And it's, it worked, but the problems we had is it just wasn't updated regularly enough. So we, we just, we had this number, it's, you know, it's say 1%, 2% at the start, it's updating really nicely coming along and it'd sit on 2% for, you know, ages and ages. And then all of a sudden, bang, it'll just jump to 90%. And this wasn't good enough because we're, we're copying a lot of data and it just got worse. The longer the replication took, the slower, it's like it's had some sort of back off on it to not update this value, this, um, status value regularly, regularly, and you know, users were thinking it had crashed basically because it just wasn't updating. So we had to fake it basically, but we didn't want to fake it in such a way that you know we would give misleading information when, if it had in fact failed, we didn't want to be faking this so that it you know looked like it was going. So um, I've made this a demonstration here that shows you what this, this um, updating I've, I've been talking about. So I've got this continuous replicate here and I'm going to update these total and completed values as the, um, as the database is getting replicated. And you'll see at the start, you know, it's quite nice. It's getting three, nine, it goes up and you'll see that it just sort of, th this is okay. It's getting some values and these, all the documents in this database I'm replicating are exactly the same. So there's no reason why it should pause for a huge amount of time and then do a massive chunk. It's not like it's doing a huge video or anything like that that would slow it down. It's just, yeah, it's just doing all these um, documents of the same size. I uploaded them all exactly the same into the server couch. As you can see, look how long it's stuck on nine for. And hopefully at some point soon, it's going to smash through and do it all. Well, as you see, this is even worse. <laughs> like this, the, the practice runs I've had of this, sometimes it's, you know, it's gone up nicely up until, you know, 100 and then died out. But as you can see this time, it's even worse. It's only stopped at nine before it's going to update. There we go, 245. So, <laughs> so this, um, this is only on a replication that's taken less than a minute. The replications that we were doing for the business had um, con so much content in there that they were taking, you know, 20, 30 minutes and this, wasn't good enough. So um, what did we do about that? The database on the iPad itself has, a, you can keep hitting this database and you can see what commit it's up to because um, it's committing these things um, in sort of batches. You can keep querying this database and see that things are happening because this number just keeps on going up. So what I'm talking about here, this is hitting the database. If I'm going to hit, um, I just copied that into, I think it was called big data base or not, database. There it is. So see this value down here, committed update sequence. It's got up to 81. So that was on zero at the start. And I could have demonstrated that to you while that um, was 
replicating that database, that number is continually going up. So the way I managed to fake this replication pro uh, progress was to just keep on hitting the local database that it's replicating into and just ensuring that this update sequence was continually going up while we're replicating. Because as I said, I didn't want to fake the replication progress when it had actually stopped. So this just allowed me to keep on hitting this and as long as this number was going up, I was able to add to my completed value on the progress bar so I knew that I was still going forward. When I suddenly got a proper update, then that was the number I'd use. I'd, I'd update that so it was correct and full but uh, in the meantime, yeah, I was able to just keep on showing that there was some progress happening. So um, yeah, that's how I got around replication progress. So if you ever need some progress while you're replicating, that's a good hack. <laughs> um, the other thing I was talking about was the filter. So basically, um, you can pass in some parameters to this filter that you're saying, I don't want to include all these documents. And you look at the the comment here, it says, you know, any JSON compatible dictionary. And, you know, if you do this with a curl request, you can pass in an array, you can pass in any JSON object you want, and it works. But for some reason, when you're doing it through Couch Coco, it just gets lost in the, in the, um, in the translation somewhere by the time it gets down to the end server. And I, I checked and saw that the JSON object that Couch Coco was ma making and passing to Couchbase Mobile uh, was correct. And somewhere in Couchbase Mobile, before it hit the end point of the server, it had just blotted away my array. And I'll show you what happens when you do this. So the, um, the array that I want to pass to it, for example, is, oh, where's it gone? Oh, we're in the wrong class. So, if we want to pass in, see this filter parameters, this is, the, this is the thing that it says you can pass any dictionary to the chase and compatible. All I want to pass in here is two arrays with some objects, object one, object two, object three. So what I'd expect to see at the end is something like this. You know, that's the expected JSON out of that type of, a, uh, type of dictionary with those arrays that I send in. But what happens when I do this filtered replicate, you see it's passed in those things that JSON dictionary, I get down uh, in my server log and I have a look at what it's passed. Here we go, some key too. It's just, it's just tied my array together. So now I've got a bunch, of, a bunch of objects that I put in an array. I needed them to be separated for the server so we could do some logic on them. Somehow I could not get this to work and um, no matter how I went around it, I just couldn't get that to work. So once again, a massive hack, I just had to use a separated string. So instead of passing in an array, I just had to separate a string and then on the server side split it up again. So that was frustrating because these things are meant to be provided. It says they work, but they just don't. So yeah, more workarounds. Now this last thing I want to talk about um, that I want to demonstrate is that replication not completing. Now, normally when you're using Couch and you do a replication, you can, you can say it's continuous. And what that means is the iPad will just continuously take any changes that are coming on the server. It'll always be checking and as changes happen, you know, it'll get them. The, the app that I was making though, we couldn't really use that mechanism because we were having a one-time sync where we synced all the data and then we had to stop the, stop the replication and walk off. So we had to know when the replication was finished. We couldn't just leave it on forever. So um, the way that you would do that is, I told you how you got the completed value and the total value. Well, it's quite simple if the completed equals the total, you've finished your replication. But if you're using a filter, that doesn't always work. And it took a long time to work this stuff out. <laughs> and it took the business a lot of their, you know, they're paying someone to do this. So these are the sort of things that became really annoying. And um, the if you're passing it through the filter, if, if one of the documents is getting filtered out from your filter, and that's the very last document the couch has to replicate, you'll never get to this completed equal total value. It'll always pull up one short. And I can demonstrate that to you again. <laughs> if I, I've got a database now with 12 documents in it on my server, uh, with three documents in it, which are done over 12 changes. And if I look at the filter on that, what I'm going to say is, can everyone see that? This is just an ID. So I've just said this filter, all it's going to do is just exclude one document. Now this document that I'm excluding in this filter has got that ID, C49 something. So if I hit that 
uh, filtered database on my server. Uh, filtered database. And I ask for the changes that have happened since the beginning of time. You'll see that I get three documents. Once again, it's really hard on this res for anyone to see, but maybe that's a bit better. There's three documents listed in the changes. And this changes API. That's what the replication uses to know what needs to, what needs to come down. And you'll see now, when I hit this, it's infinite. It gets to 11 and it just stops because the last document here, once I put the filter in place, so I put the filter now, now I say, give me all the changes with this filter. Now, if you remember, I was excluding one document from the filter. Now there's only two documents left in the changes because I have filtered that other one out. And you see the last sequence number here. This is what the replication is using and it says 12. So the replication is telling me there's 12 changes to come in here to this last sequence number. But if you look at the sequence number of the last document, it's 11 because I've filtered out the 12th change. So the Couchbase never knows it finishes because it thinks for some reason, even though you're passing with this filter, it thinks there should be 12 changes, but it's only ever getting 11 because we filtered out the last one. If it's not the last document, it'll be fine because the, it'll say, that, say there was 13 documents. If the last document wasn't the one getting filtered out, it'd be quite happy with that and it'd skip the ones that were filtered and it would work. So the way to get around this that I decided I had to do was I had to use this changes API myself. So every time the couch told me that we'd completed another update, I needed to go call the changes API and say, hey, do we really have any, filter, any changes left? And we do that by passing it a since parameter. So you can say any changes since 11, for example, which because it told me, hey, I've got up to change 11. Any changes since 11? We can see now if we're calling this ourselves that there's no changes left. So we couldn't rely on Couch telling us that it completed all these things. We had to go hit it ourselves for every time. If it came in and said, hey, we've completed 10 changes, so if I hit 10 now, you can see, oh, we've still got stuff remaining. We'll let the replication continue. When it comes in at 11, uh oh, we're finished now, even though it doesn't think we have. So we have ways of getting around things. Um, more problems that I face, as I said, I've gone on for long enough about the problems. I'm not going to demonstrate how we solve these, but replicating through a load balancer, we had a lot of staff that needed to be doing this replication at the same time, so they were balancing the load over two couch databases. Don't try doing that, it won't work. So we, <laughs> we, had to, uh, yeah, we had to sort of fudge the load balancing and make the iPad decide which way it was going to go, so the iPad would always hit one server and another iPad will always hit a different server. We had to manually do the load balancing at the iPad level so they wouldn't get switched over at any point in time through the, uh, through the life of the app. Um, loading resources in the HTML. So as I said, some of the content that was getting displayed out of uh, Couch were images and HTML documents. The HTML documents, if they referred to any images in Couch, which they can, they can do, it works, it's fine, really slow. Because every image that it has to go get, it has to make another URL request, send it off to Couch, get it back, and it just took too long. If we had, say, 10, 15 images in a piece of HTML, it took too long to load and the business wasn't happy with it. So we had to revert to using sprites to do that. So we had to get one image with all the images bundled up because the data of the images wasn't the problem. It was creating these network requests to get each image was slowing it down. So yeah, we just had to get each image in one, in one hit. Get all the images in one hit, sorry. Uh, the third thing here, the indices of couch. So once, when you're calling all these views on couch which give you back you know, a subset of the documents, it obviously indexes this so you know, it's really fast later. Once you've done a replication, throws all that in the bin. So now your users go back to using the app after they've replicated and all of a sudden it starts performing really, really slowly because all these views has to go through every single document in Couch to create all the indexes again. So yeah, that was a problem. Got around that by incorporating, hitting, hitting every view we had after we'd done a replication and just incorporating that into the replication sync time. So the user thought it was still syncing. What we were really doing is once we'd finished the sync, going off and hitting every view that we knew we'd be using in the future. Um, yeah, so what, like, what does all this mean? You know, what did I learn from all this? Now, it just wasn't suitable for you know, business applications. We've got people paying people to be de developing and using Couch to, because it's meant to be bringing them all these great features, but it just wasn't ready yet from what I found. 
and um, weren't a lot of online references, not a lot of people using it. That said, there was one developer who seemed to be, you know, it's like he never went to bed because when people were putting stuff up, you know, he was fixing them. I had a problem when 5.1 re uh, got released the other day and it just didn't work anymore, couch broke. And I posted a bug on the uh, bug tracker, went home, got up the next morning and bam, he'd fixed it. So <laughs> I told my uh, work, obviously I did it, but <laughs> no, no, I didn't do that. But um, yeah, so he was good in the do that, but just Googling stuff in general didn't yield a lot of results for the problems I was finding. And the last thing that I think maybe I, did, I didn't do well enough myself, maybe I should have delved down into Couchbase a lot more and got involved in the Erlang stuff and you know compiled my own versions because I think I spent a lot of time trying to get workarounds using the build that was provided to me, whereas if I'd gone down and tried to build it myself, perhaps I would have had more luck doing it that way and I wouldn't have spent so, so long making hacks and workarounds. So I just found it was very hard though to get in and compile Erlang code yourself and expect to, to, you know, to know what I was doing when I've never coded in Erlang in my life. So yeah, I hope I didn't bore you too much. And uh, yeah, my email address is down there. So if you find yourself stuck with anything, not that I'll be able to help you, but I might be able to tell you what I did in any of, uh, in, if I had those situations. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks to Chase for presenting this month. Melbourne Cocoa Heads is brought to you by Itty Bitty Apps, but we couldn't do it without the generous sponsorship of Shine Technologies. Thanks also to RMIT for providing the venue and to our many regular attendees, speakers and volunteers. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, you can visit us on the web at melbournecocoaheads.com or by following Melbourne Cocoa on Twitter. <laughs>